Warcraft, War of the Ancients Trilogy, Book 1, The Well of Eternity, by Richard A. Knack. Chapter 1 The tall, forbidding palace perched atop the very edge of the mountainous cliff, overlooking so precariously the vast black body of water below that it appeared almost ready to plummet into the latter's dark depths. When first a vast walled edifice had been constructed, using magic that melted both stone and forest into a single, cohesive form, it had been a wonder to touch the heart of any who saw it. Its towers were trees, strengthened by rock, with jutting spires and high, open windows. The walls were of volcanic stone raised up and bound tightly by draping vines and giant roots. The main palace at the center had originally been created by the mystical binding of more than a hundred giant trees. Bent in together, they had formed the skeleton of the rounded center, over which the stone and vines had been set. A wonder to touch the hearts of all who, when first it had been built, now it touched the fears of some. An unsettling aura enshrouded it, one heightened this stormy night. The few who peered at the ancient edifice now quickly averted their gaze. Those who looked instead to the waters below it found no peace either. The ebony lake was now violent and natural turmoil. Churning waves as high as the palace rose and fell in the distance crashing with a roar. Lightning played over its vast body, lightning gold crimson over the green of decay. Thunder rumbled like a thousand dragons, and those who lived around its shores huddled close, uncertain as to what sort of storm might be unleashed. On the wall surrounding the palace, ominous guards in forest green armor and wielding lances and swords glared warily about. They watched not only beyond the walls for foolish trespassers, but on occasion surreptitiously glanced within, particularly at the main tower, where they sensed unpredictable energies at play. And in that high tower, a stone chamber sealed from the sights of those outside, tall, narrow figures in their iridescent robes of turquoise, embroidered with stylized silver images of nature, bent over a six-sided pattern written into the floor. At the center of the pattern, symbols in a language archaic even to the wielders flat with lives of their own. Glittering silver eyes with no pupils stared out from under the hoots as the night elves muttered the spell. Their dark violet skin grew covered in sweat as the magic within the pattern amplified. All but one looked wary, ready to succumb into exhaustion. That one, overseeing the casting, watched the process not with silver orbs like the rest, but rather false black ones with streaks of ruby running horizontal along the centers. But despite the false eyes, he noted every detail, every inflection by the others. His long, narrow face, narrow even for an elf, wore an expression of hunger and anticipation as he silently drove them on. One other watched all of this, drinking in every word and gesture. Seated on a luxurious chair of ivory and leather, her rich silver hair framing her perfect features and the silken gown, as golden as her eyes, doing the same for her exquisite form. She was every inch the vision of the queen. <laughs> she leaned back against the chair, sipping wine from a golden goblet. Her jeweled bracelets tinkled, and her hand moved, and the ruby in her tiara she wore glistened in the light of the sorcerer's energies the others had summoned. Now and then, her gaze shifted ever so slightly to study the dark-eyed figure, her full lips pursing in something approaching suspicion. Yet when once he suddenly glanced her way, as if sensing her observation, all suspicion vanished, replaced by a languid smile. The chanting continued. The black leg churned madly. There had been a war, and it had ended. So Crassus knew. History would eventually rec record what happened. Almost lost in that recording would be the countless personal lives destroyed, the lands ravaged, and the near destruction of the entire mortal world. Even the memories of dragons are fleeting under such circumstances, the pale, grey-robed figure conceded to himself. He understood that very well, for, um, for though to most eyes he resembled a lanky, almost elven figure, with hawk-like features, silvering hair, and three long scars travelling down his right cheek. He was much more than that. To most, he was known as a wizard. But to a select few, he was called Coriolstras, 
a name only a dragon would wear. Crassus had been born a dragon, a majestic red one, the youngest of the great Alexstrasza's consorts. She, the aspect of life, was his dearest companion. And once again he dragged himself away from her to study the plights and futures of those short-lived races. In the hidden, rock-hewn abode he had chosen for his new sanctum, Crassus looked over the world of Azeroth. The gleaming emerald crystal enabled him to see whatever land, whatever individual he desired. And everywhere the dra dragon mage looked, he saw devastation. It seemed as if it had only been a few years ago when the grotesque green-skimmed behemoths called orcs who had invaded the world from beyond were defeated. With their remaining numbers kept in encampments, Crassus had believed the world ready for peace. Yet that peace had been short-lived. The Alliance, the human-led coalition that had been the forefront of the resistance, had immediately begun to crumble its members vying for power over one another. Part of that had been the fault of dragons, or the one dragon, Deathwing. But much had simply been the greed and desire of humans, dwarves and elves. Yet even that would have passed with little concern if not for the coming of the Burning Legion. Today, Crassus surveyed distant Kalimdo, located on the far side of the sea. Even now, Areas of it resemble a land of terrible volcanic eruption. No life, no semblance of civilization remained in those areas. It had not been any natural force, however, that had rent the land so. The Burning Legion had left nothing in its wake but death. The fairy demons had come from a place beyond reality. Magic was what they sought, magic they devoured. Attacking, in conjunction with their monstrous pawns, the undead scourge they had thought to lay waste to the world, yet they had not counted on the most unlikely alliance of all. The orcs, once also their puppets, had turned on them. They had joined the humans, elves, dwarves and dragons to decimate the demonic warriors and ghoulish beasts, and pushed the remnants back into the hellish beyond. Thousands had perished, but the alternative... The dragon snorted. In truth, there had been no alternative. Crassus waved long, tapering fingers over the orb, summoning a vision of the orcs. The view blurred momentarily, then revealed a mountainous rocky area further inland. A harsh land, but one still full of life and capable of supporting the new colonists. Already, several stone structures had risen in the main settlement, where the war chief and one of the heroes of the war, Tral, ruled. The high, rounded edifice that served as his quarters was crude by the standards of any other race, but orcs had, pro had a propensity towards basics. Extravagance to an orc was having a permanent place to live at all. There had been nomads or prisoners for so long that the concept of home had been lost to them. Several of the massive greenish figures tilled the field. Watching the tusk, brutish-looking workers, Crassus marveled at the concept of orc farmers. Thrall, however, was a highly unusual orc, and he had readily grasped the ideas that would return stability to his people. Stability was something the entire world needed badly. With another wave of his hand, the dragon mage dismissed Kalimdo, summoning now a much closer location, the once proud capital of his favoured Dalaran. Ruled by the wizards of the Kirin Tor, the prime wheels of magic. It had been at the forefront of the Alliance battle against the Burning Legion in Lord Iran, and one of the first and most prized targets of the demons in turn. Dalaran lay half in ruins, the once proud spires had all been but shattered, the great libraries burned, countless generations of knowledge had been lost, and with them, countless lives. Several of those crasses had counted as friends, or at least respected colleagues had been slain. The leadership was in disarray, and he knew that he would have to step in to lend a hand. Dalaran needed to speak with one voice, if only to keep what remained of the splintered alliance intact. Yet, despite the turmoil and tribulation still ahead, the dragon did have hope. The problems of the world were surmountable once. No more fear of orcs, no more fear of demons. Azeroth would struggle. But in the end, 
Crassus not only thought it would survive, he fully believed it would thrive. He dismissed the Emerald Crystal and Rose. The Dragon Queen, his beloved Alexstrasza, would be awaiting him. She suspected his desire to return to help the mortal world, and, of all dragons, she most understood. He would transform to his true self, bid her farewell for a time, and depart before regrets held him back. The sanctum he had chosen not only for his seclusion, but also for its massiveness. Stepping from the smaller chamber, Crassus entered a toothy cavern, whose heights readily matched the now lost towers of Dalaran. An army could have bivouacked in the cavern and not filled it. Just the right size for a dragon. Crassus stretched his arms, and as he did, his tipping fingers lengthened further, becoming talent. His back arched, and from near the shoulders erupted twin growths that quickly transformed into fledgling wings. His long features stretched, turning reptilian. Throughout all these lesser changes, Crassus' form expanded. He became four, five, even ten times the size of a man, and continued to grow. Any semblance to a human or elf had quickly faded. From wizard, Crassus became Coriolstras, dragon. But, in the very midst of the transformation, a desperate voice suddenly filled his head. Cor Stras. He faltered, all but reverting to his wizardly form. Crassus blinked, then stared around the huge chamber as if seeking the source of the cry there. Nothing. The dragon mage waited and waited, but the call did not repeat. Shrugging it off to his own uncertainties, he commenced again with the transformation. And again, the desperate voice cried, Croyalstra. This time, he recognized it. Immediately, he responded in kind, I hear you. What is it that you need of me? There was no response, but Crassus sensed the desperation remaining. Focusing, he tried to reach out, establishing a link with the one who so badly needed his aid. The one who should have needed no aid from any creature. I am here, the dragon mage demanded. Sense me. Give me some indication of what is wrong. He felt the barest touch in return, a faint hinting of some distress. Crassus concentrated every iota of his thoughts into the meager link, hoping, hoping. The overpowering presence of a dragon whose magic dwarfed his own a thousandfold sent Crassus staggering. A sensation of centuries, of great age, engulfed him. Crassus felt as if time itself now surrounded him in all terrible majesty. A sensation of centuries, of great age, engulfed him. Crassus felt as if time itself now surrounded him in all its terrible majesty. Not time, not quite, but he who was the aspect of time. The dragon of the ages, Nostormu. There were only four great dragons, four great aspects, of which his beloved Elistrasso was life. Mad Malagos was magic, and Eteroi Zera influenced dreams. They, along with brooding Nostormu, represented creation itself. Crassus grimaced. In truth, there happened five aspects. The fifth had once been called Nalfarion, the Earth Water. But long ago, in a time even Crassus could not recall clearly, Nalfarion had betrayed his Bothellos. The Earth Water had turned on them, and in the process had garnered a new, more appropriate title Deathwing, the Destroyer. The very thought of Deathwing stirred Crassus from astonishment. He absently touched the three scars on his cheek. Had Deathwing returned to plague the world again? Was that why the great Nostormu would show such distress? I hear you, Crassus mentally called back, now more than ever fearful of the reason for the call. I hear you. Is it... is it the Destroyer? But in response, she was once again buffeted by an overwhelming series of astonishing images. The images burned themselves into his head, making it impossible for Crassus to ever forget any. In either form, Crassus, however adaptable and capable, was no match for the unbridled power of an aspect. 
the force of the other's dragon's mental might flung him back against the nearest wall, where the mage collapsed. It took several minutes for Crassus to push himself up from the floor, and even then his head spun. Fragmented thoughts, not his own, assailed his senses. It was all he could do for a time just to remain conscious. Slowly, though, things stabilized enough for him to realize the scope of all that had just happened. Nostormal, Lord of Time, had been desperately crying out for aid. His aid. He had turned specifically to the lesser dragon, not one of his compatriots. But anything that would so distress an aspect could only be a monumental threat to the rest of Azeroth. Why then chose a lone red dragon and not Alexstrasza or Ysera? He tried once more to reach the great dragon, but his efforts only made his head swim again. Steadying himself, Crassus tried to decide what to do instead. One image in particular constantly demanded his attention, the image of a snow-swept mountain area in Kalimdor. Whatever Nostormo had sought to explain to him had to do with that desolate region. Crassus would have to investigate it, but he would need capable assistance, someone who would adapt readily. While Crassus prided himself on his ability to adapt well, his species was, for the most part, obstinate and set in its ways. He needed someone who would listen, but who would also react instantly as unfolding events required. No. For such unpredictable effort, only one creature would serve. A human. In particular, a human named Ronin. A wizard. And in Kalimdo, on the steps of the wild country, a grizzled age orc leaned close over a smoky fire, mumbling words whose origins lay on another, long-lost world. The moss-green figure tossed some leaves upon the fire, increasing the already thick smoke. Fumes filled his humble wood and earth hut. The bald elderly orc leaned over and inhaled. His wary brown eyes were veined and his skin hung in sacks. His teeth were yellow, chipped, and one of his tusks had been broken off years before. He could scarcely rise without aid, and when he walked, he did so stooped, slow. Yet even the hardiest warrior paid him filthy as shaman. A bit of bone dust, a touch of tanar berries, all part of a tried and true tradition re resurrected among the orcs. Kalfa's father had taught them all, even during the dark years of the Horde, just as Kalfa's grandsire had taught his father before that. And now, for the first time, the withered shaman found himself hoping he had been taught well. Voices murmured in his head. <laughs> Voices murmured in his head, the spirits of the world that the orcs now called home. Normally, they whispered little things, life things, but now they murmured anxiously, warning. Warning. But of what? He had to know more. Kalfa reached into a pouch at his waist, removing three dried black leaves. They were almost all of what remained from a single plant brought with him from the orc's ancient world. Kalfa had been warned not to use them, unless he deemed it truly necessary. His father had never used him, nor his grandfather. The shaman tossed them into the flames. Instantly, the smoke turned thick, swirling blue. Not black, but blue. The orc's brow furrowed at this change of colour. Then he leaned forward again and inhaled as much as possible. The world transformed and witted the orc. It became a bird, a huge avian soaring over the landscape. It flew over mountains without care. With his eyes he saw the tiniest animals, the most distant rivers. A sense of exhilaration not felt since his youth almost overwhelmed Kalfa, but he fought to it. To give in would risk him losing his sense of self. He might fly forever as a bird, never knowing what he had once been. Even as he thought that, Kalfa suddenly noticed a wrongness in the nature of the world, possibly the reason for the voice's concern. Something was that should not be. He veered in the direction that felt correct, growing more anxious as he drew nearer. And just within the deepest part of the mountain range, 
The shaman discovered the source of his anxiety. His learned mind knew that he envisioned the concept, not the actual thing. To Kalfa, it appeared as a water funnel, yet one that swallowed and disgorged simultaneously. But what emerged or sank into his depths were days and nights, months and years. The funnel seemed to be eating and emitting time itself. The notion so staggered the shaman that he did not notice until almost too late that the funnel now saw to draw him in as well. Immediately, Kalfa strained to free himself. He flapped his wings, pushed with his muscles. His mind reached to his physical form, tugging hard at the Gossaman link tying body to soul and trying to break the trance. Still, the fauna drew him forward. In desperation, Kalfa called upon the spirit guides, prayed to them to strengthen him. They came as he knew they would. But at first they seemed to act too slow. The funnel filled his view, seemed ready to engulf him. The world abruptly twisted around the shaman, the funnel, the mountains. Everything turned about and about. With a gasp, Kalfara awoke. Exhausted beyond his years, he barely kept himself from falling face first into the fire. The voices that constantly murmured had faded away. The orc sat on the floor of his hut trying to reassure himself that, yes, he now existed whole in the mortal world. The spirit guides had saved him, albeit barely in time. But with that happy reassurance came the reminder of what he had witnessed in his vision, and what it meant. A must tell frowl, he muttered, forcing weary age legs up. I must tell him quick, else we'll lose our home, our world, again.